Good evening, ghouls and gals, and welcome to another episode of the Mania Podcast. I am your host, Harlequin Grimm, and as always, I am honored to have you joining me. Today, I'd like to start this episode by asking a few questions. Just what are the processes which constitute human life? Is there a fundamental difference between the mechanisms of a wolf or bat and that of a human's? Or are we simply more complex? Is there a quota of neurons which give rise to consciousness? Or is there something deeper? Something more fundamental and strange? Something perhaps ghostly in the inner workings of this fleshy machine? Humans have long since been haunted by this question. And now it is here, at the heart of this show. Just what is the force which allows us not only to move, but to think critically, to question, decide, and self-reflect? In other words, what is consciousness? And if indeed it is something which other creatures do not possess, just where do we find ours? It doesn't seem to matter how many pints of blood we sieve through, how many tendons, pieces of cartilage, and nerve tissue we cut to ribbons and examine under a microscope, no matter how much brain matter we dissect or ribs we cut open to peek into the complex, messy insides throbbing to keep us alive. There seems to be no one element amidst all this gory matter, not in the heart nor the brain, which we can pluck out and label clearly as consciousness, and yet we surely have it. This question which still troubles philosophers and scientists alike was the very same question which haunted the scientists, chemists, and earliest pioneers of human physiology, anatomists. That one question, what and where is the essence of human life? And it would take a sea of dissected cadavers to even begin to scratch the surface of that question. And first, we would have to map out the overwhelming maze of arteries, organs, and bones somehow coalescing to keep us alive. Throughout history, a common theme in the substrate of scientific discovery is the tossing away of old assumptions and false virtues to give rise to something greater, knowledge. One of which was the sanctity of the dead, of corpses. In the second episode, The Chapel of Bones, I discussed the common beliefs around burial practices and why it was crucial for many people in the Middle Ages to know that they and their loved ones would be buried in consecrated ground. And centuries later, now to this tale setting of the 17 and 1800s, and this belief still hasn't been nudged much further. Few people wanted their own corpse, or that of their loved ones, to be tampered with after death. Nowadays, when people of Judeo-Christian faith speak of Judgment Day, it is often in a metaphorical sense. But for people in this time period, preparing for judgment was not only a matter of symbolic or spiritual preparation, one also had to be very practical about keeping one's body intact following death. Put simply, if the time ever came to be literally resurrected and judged, many people assumed that your body needed to be intact as you crawled out from the grave before God and his angels. The less scars and less missing fingers, the better. And so, this made it difficult to convince people to let themselves be examined or dissected after they died. It was not only a dishonor, it meant that it would lessen one's chances of passing on into heaven or any afterlife that awaited them. But eventually, reason and religion found a crossroads by which to compromise. The rapid expansion of medical schools called for an increase in cadavers. So in 1751, England passed the Murder Act, thereby allowing the corpses of murderers to be used for experimentation. To further increase the supply, the government increased the number of crimes by which hanging was the punishment. And this was, at first, helpful for anatomists, who never had an abundance of cadavers, and often had to pursue their own ventures of scientific discovery in illegal terms. But this also satisfied a twisted sense of justice 
with the general public, for the reasons aforementioned, to be experimented on after death was only further punishment for the criminals in the eyes of those watching, a kind of post-mortem torture following an exquisitely just execution. However, after more crimes were made punishable by hanging, crime rates actually dropped, something that people didn't necessarily prepare for. So the increasing demand for cadavers simply could not be met, even with the help of the Murder Act. What arose from this demand was a new profession, thieves known as resurrectionists, which is probably now my favorite word. These professionals would steal into graveyards in the dead of night, harvest a fresh body, and sell it to anatomists or scientists looking to experiment. Leading anatomists in the 17th and 18th centuries regularly paid for resurrectionists. And as you can imagine, dissection was a controversial topic. Still, the intricacies of the human body's inner workings vexed the interest of scholars and common citizens alike. Dissections were often performed with an audience, even if they were done illegally. And oftentimes, admittance would come at a price, almost like paying for a performance at a theater. People were curious just what would be discovered in the clandestine laboratories of artists and scientists, all striving, bone by bone, vein by vein, to discover and depict the true nature of the human body. the groundwork laid out, we can get to our first concrete date of November 6th, 1787, when a peculiar kind of experiment was being performed, not merely a dissection. Using a frog's severed lower half and some basic electrodes, an Italian anatomist, Luigi Galvani, discovered that he could cause a frog's leg muscle to contract by placing an iron wire to the muscle and a copper wire to the nerve. This discovery sent a shockwave throughout the scientific community. The anatomist opined that there existed such a thing as an animal electricity, a liquid substance which existed in living beings and acted as a kind of electricity to animate us to life. This inspired many others to apply electricity to animals, a spreading phenomena of experimentation which quickly grew morbid. And so, another scientific branch sprouted out from the mounds of delicately dissected corpses and dark questions whose answers lay wrapped beneath cold flesh and venous tissue. Galvanism was born, the contraction of muscle stimulated by an electrical current. Nowadays, after fine-tuning, the study is called electrophysiology. And perhaps it sounds mad, but it just so turns out that applying bolts of lightning to a dead frog wasn't such a bad idea after all. Galvani's experiment cannot be understated for its importance in sparking curiosity amongst the general public and the scientific community. Sixteen years later, and the medical world is still quarreling over conclusions being made from Galvani's experiment, and by this time, the notion that there was a relationship between electricity and the processes of life was still at least a century old. But just what this relationship entailed, and how it behaved within the finer details of our anatomy was difficult to agree upon. But there were others who disagreed with these theories. In an attempt to fight back against the negative responses from other scientists, Giovanni Aldini, an Italian physicist, performed his own experiment. After all, the implications were equally as important as the initial discovery. That is, just how a human body would respond to such stimuli. It seems like a common step, from one kind of biological matter to the next, but to toy with the body of a frog and that of a human's is far different and a more shocking demonstration. Mm -hmm. 
Foster's sentencing itself is with no small amount of unanswered questions. Foster was sentenced to hang on account of drowning both his daughter and wife in Paddington Canal, London. Foster fought the sentencing initially, however, eventually gave a full confession just before his hanging. Centuries later, what can we say about a man like this? With a wife and child, and two more children of which he could not support, whom spent most of their time in a workhouse, is it not fair to suggest that the majority of Foster's life was ruled and decided by hardship and tragedy? Shortly before his sentencing, Foster scrambled to fashion a knife out of crude metals in his holding cell in the Newgate prison. He had managed to sharpen something of a stake out of the materials of the bed frame, and with it, he attempted to stab himself. He was afraid. He was afraid because officials had told him that his capital punishment involved dissection. Foster knew staring up with cold sweat from his seat in the courtroom, that his body had a chance of not being hanged properly. He knew that his chest would be cut open, that his insides would be there for a whole room of eager observance to examine. But what he feared most was that, somehow, he would be awake for it all. So, he wanted to make sure the job was done properly. Back then, it was common that hangings didn't go according to plan, that bodies were released too soon, that people were buried alive, made only unconscious by asphyxiation. And to further muddy the waters, close friends of Foster and his family knew that his wife was suicidal. Not only that, but that she spoke of killing her child long before the deaths occurred. Could it have been that Foster, caught in a tangled web of poverty, deep psychological distress, and despair for being unable to support his family, took the fall of actions committed by his wife? As Aldini's hands brushed over the first implements, of his experiment, nervous with fingers shaking before the audience. Is it possible that he was considering similar thoughts, too? I like to think that Aldini was very aware of this possibility. However, he was distracted by the overshadowing potential for what the experiment might provide, the knowledge it might give. In fact, George Foster's body had been specifically delivered to the Royal College of Surgeons to be publicly dissected. But what shocked him most in the audience that day was that the corpse was destined and used for much more. After making careful incisions to expose certain nerves, Aldini applied an electrical current to Foster's face. From this, we are given this quotation taken directly from historic records. The jaws of the deceased criminal began to quiver, and the adjoining muscles were horribly contorted, and one eye was actually opened. In the subsequent part of the process, the right hand was raised and clenched, and the legs and thighs were set in motion. End quote. Upon application of his implements, the chamber was often filled with a burning, sparking burst of electrical currents. These arcs would ignite in brilliant shades of turquoise. Along the walls, the silhouette of Aldini standing with his arms outstretched towards the writhing corpse would be painted in brief but stark shadows. All the while, the stench of singed flesh and hair curled upwards into the air. Low gasps became astonished cries, and all manner of responses could be seen. Some spectators could scarcely turn their eyes away, believing that Foster was in the process of reanimation. Others, going quickly pale, struggled to stand upright, while some simply fainted. Through the use of galvanism, the deceased body of George Foster appeared to be stirring from his sleep. And with it, the secret of humanity's essence seemed to be rearing its head. Could it have been, in those intense intermittent flashes of electricity causing his corpse to convulse, we were all watching the primordial essence of human life itself sparking between electrodes.
Taking a step back from Aldini's experiment, we venture deeper into a maze of cold skin the color of porcelain. We sift through the hundreds of dirtied hands, trading cadavers for currency, past vials of embalming fluids, and operating tables being scrubbed of stains soaked too deep in the fibers of wood. The serene, closed eye gaze of those passed away, awaiting examination. Their silent company, and the rest of the world's held breath, waiting for what secrets are hidden beneath the layers. A spark of lightning, a charged volt, a rod seeking an opposing metal, or a soft organ. And perhaps, with some precision, another chance and breath at life. But many of these galvanists weren't trying to do anything necessarily as dramatic as reanimation. They simply wanted to further demonstrate Galvani's theories which stemmed from his original experiment. There were, however, some who wanted to take those bold claims just that much further. On November 4th, 1818, adjacent to the steps of the High Court in Glasgow, two silhouettes shambled up the creeping steps to the gallows. It was the first public execution to take place in Glasgow for almost a whole decade, and throngs had developed to watch the spectacle. The first feet to drop belonged to Simon Ross, a thief, whose prolonged several-minute-long struggle transfixed the audience. His spinal cord had been left intact, so he suffered for quite some time. But afterwards, his body was wheeled to the Ramshorn Cemetery in Merchant City, where he would be buried in a pauper's grave. Next up was Matthew Clydesdale, a 35-year-old miner who drunkenly killed a colleague with a pickaxe. At a peak age and athletically built, he looked that much more out of place as the noose was tightened around his neck, and following a brief declaration of guilt, the murderer was released into the open air. Unlike Ross, Clydesdale's execution was instantaneous, but what happened to him afterwards, however, would be far more prolonged and entertaining. Promptly, the body was taken to the University of Glasgow, to the open arms of James Jeffrey, a professor of anatomy and physiology, as well as his assistant, Andrew Uhr, who once served as an army surgeon and taught chemistry. Surprisingly enough, it was Professor Uhr's passion which would lead the experiment on the night of November 4th. Before an audience for the second time that day, Clydesdale's body was drained of blood for nearly an hour to better identify his insides and minimize the mess of the ensuing experiment. While scientists like Aldini were bent on defending galvanic principles, Professor Uhr had higher ambitions. Just ten months earlier, on January 1st of the same year, Mary Shelley's The Modern Prometheus, more commonly known as Frankenstein, was published. Whether or not her story inspired the following events or was written in tandem with them is difficult to say. During this time, writers and scientists had an interesting overlap of passions as scientific journals often acted as a form of entertainment for the general public and inspired artists as well. An anatomist, for example, would struggle to rise to fame or have their discoveries well known if their drawings of dissections were not clear, precise, and beautiful. And just as well, scientists often wrote poetry and were prone to philosophy, inspired by their experiments. All the same, Professor Uhr wheeled in a bulky contraption beside the body of Clydesdale, what he brought was a battery charged with dilute nitric and sulfuric acids, prepared minutes before the police delivered the body to the anatomical theater, now as packed as the hanging. With precision, Professor Uhr made incisions at the neck, hip, and heels to expose Clydesdale's nerves. Electrode rods in either hand, Uhr played puppeteer as many others had before him. Only, his intentions were far greater. His brows were furrowed in concentration as he applied the instruments to the body. The corpse's diaphragm responded to the electricity, a success which sparked a smile on the chemist's face. The chest proceeded to heave and fall, as if to breathe, igniting a wave of reactions from the audience, and the surprise of Geoffrey James, now looking much more like an assistant himself, as he reached out for something to support his weight. Much like a defibrillator, Uhr had used the electrodes to target Clydesdale's heart, but the success was short-lived. And so when the body ceased breathing, the chemist wasted no time and proceeded as planned to other areas of the body 
As he sparked various nerves to life, the chemist's language transformed into something more akin to poetry. He addressed the audience with an inspired aura, a demeanor of resolved impatience. He spoke with urgency, describing how the body gave a violent shuddering as if from a cold. Of the fingers, he said that they moved nimbly, like those of a violin performer. And when he stimulated the muscles of Clydesdale's skull, he narrated the result, his voice rising over the unsettling noise of electricity lapping at the air. He said, Every muscle in his countenance is simultaneously thrown into fearful action. Rage, horror, despair, anguish, and ghastly smiles unite their hideous expression in the murderer's face, surpassing far the wildest representations of a Fuseli or a Keen. The professor was referencing a painter, Fuseli, who's best known for his piece The Nightmare, and Keen, a Shakespearean stage actor. When this demonstration was made in hand with the impassioned description, Several chairs were thrust aside as spectators fled from the theater out of terror. Some, on their way out, only just managed to hold back the nausea long enough, and one gentleman just collapsed. The experiment lasted nearly an hour. Professor Uhr and Jeffrey applied their methods to the body ceaselessly. When they failed to resurrect Clydesdale, Andrew struggled to maintain his composure and was seen resisting the urge to overturn a tray of instruments. It was Professor Jeffrey who convinced Uhr to stop, as the chemist was unwilling to accept defeat. And in the end, Professor Uhr concluded that if death had not been caused by such violent injuries, life would have been restored. Though the excitement for the hanging and subsequent experimentation eventually died away, Professor Uhr's passion was only aggravated. Memories from that evening followed the chemist around. The sensation of nearing success, watching the flickers of life flutter across the corpse's face. It trailed him on his evening walks, interrupted his lectures at the university. It stalled his pen when he recorded findings for other research papers. One late evening, just two days later, a gloved hand reached out through a cracked door in the University of Glasgow. A brief exchange was made, and a pouch of coins fell into the outstretched palm, one which smelled of an odor all too familiar to Professor Ur. And in the deepest hours of that morning, a resurrectionist knocked on the back door of the anatomical theater for the second time that night. When the door was opened, she wheeled in the second body, which had been hung on November 4th, the one that had been so unceremoniously dumped into a shallow grave, the one that nobody would remember. With a second and final payment, Andrew Ur dismissed the resurrectionist and cast aside the cloth, covering none other than Simon Ross. But as the door was bolted behind her, the grave snatcher could hear the peculiar sound of sparking electricity. Just beneath it, the professor's voice as he murmured to Ross's body quietly. The two were alone in the study. The grave snatcher, a woman going by the alias of Tessa Gray in the thriving community of resurrectionists, felt something different about this. Her business wasn't always clean, but there was something about Andrew Uhr which unsettled her. He wasn't like most other scientists. It wasn't that he seemed scalpel happy and greedy to dissect his subject. Most anatomists had this air about them, hungry for discovery. This was different, or perhaps simply exacerbated. Nevertheless, Gray lingered. As her one ear heard the gentle patter of rain, with the other she listened, pressed against the door of the anatomical theater. The professor was going to have to be quick. If this was legal, he wouldn't have hired her, and moreover, the press from the hangings and the public experiment on Clydesdale had satiated both the scientific community and caused an uproar in the public. What she heard soon after were the swift footsteps of Ur as he moved from operating table to desk, recording observations with swift scratches. Ink and blood splattered alike across the page as he flitted to and fro, then, based off the harsh, wet, smacking sound, Gray concluded that electrodes 
had been applied, just as the professor had done two days earlier to Clydesdale. Gray pressed her ear harder against the door. Again, there was that sound, as if moisture in the air was slapping against itself repeatedly. Silence ensued afterwards. Then she heard the ragged breath of Professor Orr, followed by two heavy thuds, the sound of the electrodes being dropped from his hands. Orr murmured something, and then the resurrectionist heard a voice respond, another voice. A rumbling groan followed by a fit of coughs as well. Then finally, from a throat, dry and rubbed raw from a noose, came a plea. A word so low, but just harsh enough to reach Gray's ears. Water, Simon Ross begged. There was a crash likely a beaker shattering against the ground, then a fit of triumphant laughter, which Gray recognized to be her clients. The resurrectionist forced herself away from the door. She stumbled, falling over her heels as she scrambled backwards, unable to take her eyes off the door, unable to accept what she'd heard. The voice of the corpse echoed louder in her head. She tried to parcel out the details, tried to make sense of it in any way that was other than what truly happened. As she fled across the city, all she could hear or think about was the dry rasp of a voice belonging to a man she'd watched hang just days before. Water, the corpse had said. The events which follow, both the public and illegal experiments of Andrew Orr, only add to the story's mystery. On December 29th of 1818, a mob protesting the galvanic experiments smashed the windows of Professor James Jeffrey's house. In a separate event of body snatching, a family had come to the conclusion that their corpse of their daughter had been exhumed from the Ramshorn Cemetery, the same cemetery where Simon Ross had been buried. Despite the mob's fury, the accusation was actually false. It was typical for Professor Jeffrey to receive much of the university's backlash with grievances taken against anatomical research. The body of one Janet McAllister was later found to be in the dissecting room of the College Street Medical School. McAllister was found alongside five other bodies, one of which belonged to a young male, a thief recognized by the public, and one that you know well as Simon Ross. When pressed, Clinicians looking to restore the reputation of the medical school insisted that they'd actually found Simon Ross just a day earlier, not taken from a grave, either. His corpse had been found in the street, they'd said. Poorly dressed, and with several strange, professionally sutured incisions along his body, which were there prior to their own dissection. And despite the date of his hanging, obvious signs and evidence seemed to suggest he'd been dead for only a day. And there were scars along his feet when they found him, they explained, as if he had been shuffling aimlessly in the streets for days on end prior to his death. The mob and its inexplicable findings were the topic of the news for days to come. Simon Ross's grave was checked and found to be empty. When the press called for relatives and friends of the deceased to come forward to identify the male corpse found in the medical school, there was nobody to offer evidence no lid to put over the coffin of the mystery. Soon enough, stories about Simon Ross's unexplicable condition as a recently deceased body found nearly two months following his hanging spread. Of course, these theories were passed off as simply fanciful retellings, and widely, it was accepted that the corpse was simply a lookalike to Simon Ross, while the true thief, many believed, had simply been dissected and discarded weeks earlier just like any other subject at a medical school. Nothing but figments, one Glasgow Herald article stated on the event, inspired by Mary Shelley's recent publication, 
the modern Prometheus, and nothing more. For this episode, I would like to do something a little bit different. Instead of skipping to the part where we dissect what was true and what was fiction, I'd like to add a conclusion, some afterthoughts that I had after writing the story. So here it is. My fascination with anatomists in this time period is insatiable. There seems to be no end in sight when it comes to my willingness to research more, and there is no doubt that I'll feature more stories with resurrectionists and ill-reputed scientists sometime in the future perhaps with less a focus on galvanism itself, rather the relationship between body snatcher and client. That is what is simply so satisfying and fascinating to read about. But the poignant themes in this story aren't just sitting adjacent to Mary Shelley's. Although the tale of Frankenstein is well known, and its contents stemmed from the controversial pursuits of galvanism, there is something deeper, something more fundamental, still applicable to our own time and societies today. What galvanism represented was a potential answer to a question as old as humanity itself, our essence or soul. And where did that essence go upon death, and if it can be made in the womb, can it be crafted between human hands? Although now we understand that rudimentary electricity is not enough alone to resurrect a body long after its death, we have of course brought people back from the dead after their heart has stopped beating. But this is a red herring, I argue. This gets away from the fascination that galvanism was stoking in the flames of its contemporaries. What galvanism was really getting at was the creation of human life, and its trademark consciousness outside of normal or accepted conditions. That is, to bring back a human life that was supposed to be dead, or had been dead for far longer than a few days or minutes. Or in Mary Shelley's case, to craft one entirely from scraps alone. Because then, there becomes an onus on the creator of such an individual, much like a mother, to imbue it with a good life, a life with love, with compassion, kindness, and as little suffering as possible, all the things we would hope for our own children. That is the fundamental problem of bringing any sentient creature into the world, the inevitability that, without the right tools, it may suffer at such lengths so as to make the life itself not worth creating or indeed living. And although we're past that, and although we're beyond snatching up dead bodies to dissect, we are still on the precipice of something much similar to what was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. We are on the precipice of creating artificial intelligence. Currently, we can't even nail down a clear definition for consciousness, and that's problematic. We don't know what it looks like, we don't know what we're searching for deep in the synapses of our minds, but we know that some form of self-awareness exists in humans and presumably the kind that we have is attained with a certain degree of intelligence. Of course, what accompanies this is suffering. Now, with the technology ushering forward a new era of self-aware creatures, not made in the womb, but manufactured by human hands, just like in Shelley's fiction, this conundrum of the Frankenstein is more prevalent than ever, and I might add, not getting that much closer to being solved. When Dr. Frankenstein made his creature, as soon as it resurrected, he fled the room out of terror. He left the creature alone. The creature, because it was left alone, and was given no love, no attention, and no introduction into this existence, responded bitterly. And only then, truly, did it begin to act like a monster. But who was really at fault? The newborn life? Or its creator? He who had ample opportunity to prepare for ushering in this experiment with as much responsibility as possible. At this moment, humanity is Dr. Frankenstein, so obsessed with this novel idea of creation that we don't have the presence of mind to look forward to the obvious problems awaiting us should our experiment succeed, if indeed we do manage to create a creature that is sentient. Not if, but when the experiment goes awry, when disaster inevitably strikes the newspapers, 
we'll be asking the same question posed by Mary Shelley centuries ago. Who really is the monster here? So thank you for indulging me in listening to what I find to be the root of fiction, the importance of questioning things and finding themes throughout the characters. But now we can get onward into the next part. As I mentioned before, I was particularly thrilled to write this story, especially when I found historical documents which noted the events of Luigi Galvani, Giovanni Aldini, but most of all, Professor Andrew Uhr. With Galvani and his cousin, there seemed little need to fabricate anything. Here I was able to introduce the Resurrectionists as well, which were both a key role in history as well as this story. However, I did little to exaggerate their roles, if any at all. In fact, I, I had the sense that I was downplaying their importance. Before, during, and after the murder act, they were crucial to the development of anatomical research. Again, there was very little dazzling required for the exposition and general bulk of the story. Galvanism and anatomy are fascinating enough, and they always will be. What stuck out to me immediately as any opportunity was Andrew Orr, who was largely noted as being one of the prime scientists who looked specifically to reanimate corpses rather than use them as a means to demonstrate proof of Galvani's theory regarding animal electricity. Whether or not there are more scientists who also attempted reanimation, I am not altogether certain, but this certainly was the most publicized one. The experiment conducted on November 4th, 1818, was a true event in history, as well as the executions taken that day. The recounts of spectators fainting, vomiting, and fleeing isn't superfluous in the slightest, unless, of course, the original newspapers from those times were being superfluous, in which case I was too because I copied what they were saying. Perhaps it is obvious by now, but to clear the air, the events which followed that failed experiment were entirely fabricated. I did, in fact, find that a body had gone missing from Ranshorn Cemetery. There was, in fact, an angry mob which blamed James Jeffrey of the University of Glasgow, and the body had, indeed, been found in another medical college, along with five others. The additional detail, however, that it was Simon Ross's body, the thief who had been executed alongside Clydesdale, was a fiction through and through, though Simon Ross was real. That Andrew Orr attempted to bring him to life, and succeeded, was a mirror to Mary Shelley's story, and was made to highlight the idea that we are closer than we think, often, on discovering opportunities we are not at all prepared to handle. So to recap, all the experiments performed by the Galvanists were documented in history. The only one that I had fabricated was Simon Ross. Clydesdale and all the others were entirely true. Now, the only character in this story who was entirely fictional was Tessa Gray, the resurrectionist who was paid to unearth Simon Ross. After being unable to resist the urge to give the resurrectionists a spotlight in the introduction, I felt that they deserved a character in the narrative, and more crucially, that they were portrayed to be the innocent enablers of scientists who had nothing to do with the experiment themselves. Just like any other bystander, they'd be shocked to find the results of a galvanist work on a body. And with that, We've reached the conclusion of episode 4. And lastly, a big thank you to Curious Fire for providing the show's introductory theme, and Windswept, a Swedish music producer who does all of the other soundtracks that you hear throughout. Thank you for joining me again for another story. Happy hauntings, and I will see you next time. If you enjoy this podcast, you might have noticed that there are no ads or sponsors. This show is best narrated without any interruptions, so if you've been enjoying Mania, 
please share it with your friends, use it to open up a summoning portal, or simply go to harlequingrim.com support and toss your show some spare change. It's as simple as expressing your enjoyment for something you value. Thank you for your continued support. <laughs>